Thanks for listening to the sermon podcast from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planning churches. You're about to hear a message that was preached live from one of our recent church services. We hope that you'll open your heart to hear the Holy Spirit speaking directly through this message. Stay tuned after the message for information on how to get connected with us. Thanks again, and enjoy today's message. I almost feel like I need to apologize for the word I'm about to speak to you this morning, but I, I, I am confident that this is a word from God. I want you to open up in your Bible with me to Colossians chapter 3, because I know that this is not your typical Sunday morning message, and because if you have ever turned on a Christian television or listened to Christian preaching on the radio, uh, this is not a topic you're going to hear preached very often. Indeed, it's not one that I've preached very often myself, but it is a consistent and ongoing theme throughout, especially the New Testament and teaching of Jesus. And so as I read through some of these scriptures in the last week, God was dealing with me, how come you don't preach on this? And so this is the result of that. Colossians chapter 3, if you join me there for a moment, I want to show you a, a graphic up on the screen. This is a, a, um, a this is a, a poll that was taken by uh, YouGov in the year 2021. And uh, the, the title that you might be able to see up there says, What Animal Could You Beat in a Fight? And these are the results of this poll. Compared to women, men feel most able to take on medium-sized dogs and geese. But that's not the big takeaway from this. So what you're seeing here is the percentage of people who feel confident that they would be able to beat different animals in a hand-to-hand fight. This is an unarmed fight. In other words, you don't have a weapon, you don't have a knife, you don't have a gun. You're just going to take on some wild animal, and this is the percentages of people who said, yeah, I can do that. All right, I'll start at the bottom because it's a little bit more reasonable. So at the bottom, you have a rat. So how confident do you feel that you could beat a rat in a fight? I know Mr. Saban's going to do well. (laughs) Long story. We'll come back to that later. But of the correspondents, 76% of men say, I got that. 76. And 68% of women. The next one up is a house cat. How confident do you feel a fight between you and a house cat that you would be able to win? In other words, a a duel to the death. 74% of men said yes. 64% of women. Uh, The next one up is kind of of hilarious. The goose, known for their cantankerous attitudes. 71% of men said, yeah, I can get that goose. But only 51% of women are confident. So I don't want to go through the whole thing. Let's just skip up to the top because this is what's really interesting to me. Now, we're not talking about a fight between you and a rat or you and a cat. But up here at the top of the list, The third one down says the word elephant. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an elephant. They're very large. And if they get upset, they get very aggressive. But despite the massive size, the large tusks, the trunk that could literally toss you across the room, still there are 8% of women and 9% of men who say, I could fight that and win. Okay, that's not as crazy as it gets. (laughs) The next one up says, a lion, the king of the jungle. Could you imagine trying to fight barehanded against a lion? Now, we know David said he did it, but he did it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about hand-to-hand combat with a creature that is... I don't know, five, six hundred pounds of lean muscle mass and sharp teeth. Uh, But still, uh, 7% of men say no problem. And uh, the top one on the list is one of my favorites, a grizzly bear. I did a little bit of research on the grizzly bear just to show you how silly this is. But a grizzly bear, the average grizzly bear weighs 900 pounds. It is able to chase you up a tree if it wants to. 
it can run up to 35 miles per hour. And so what I'm saying is that if a grizzly bear has it in its mind to kill you, you're dead. That's right. (laughs) There's no denying. You're not going to be able to fight against this. But there are still 7% of men and 6% of women who say, grizzly bear, no problem. (laughs) Now, I just want to ask, is this a reasonable confidence or an unreasonable confidence? This is what you call being overconfident. Even if you are Chuck Norris, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Bruce Lee combined into one superhuman, you are not going to beat a grizzly bear. Do you see what I'm saying? Who are these people? These 7% of men and 6% of women who are confident. Yes, I can take on a grizzly bear. These are people who are walking time bombs. You hear what I'm saying? These are people who are heading off of a cliff and they don't even know it. Now, we might look at a list like this and say, how stupid are they to think they could face a grizzly bear and conquer it? But in our scripture today, Paul is going to aim his attention on people, not who are overconfident about fighting an animal, but who are overconfident about their salvation. It is a possible thing this morning that we can grow what what the Bible says presumptuous about our salvation. Now, I'm not here to preach everybody to hell this morning, but I am here to remind you, as the Apostle Paul did, that hell is real and that it is necessary for us to be reminded of it sometimes. It is not outside the realm of possibilities. And for us to say, ah, hell's no problem for me, I'm a Christian now, is like saying, I can take on a grizzly bear. No problem. So I might be preaching to 6% or 7% of people here this morning, but I think it's necessary because it is all throughout the the New Testament. Let's read our scripture, Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, now remember, this is all amazing stuff so far, speaking to people who are right with God, who have been changed by God, who are now in Christ. But listen to the language of the Apostle Paul. To you people who are saved, he says, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because, here's the key, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. This is a message I've titled, The Reminder of God's Wrath. It is important for us to be reminded that there are some things God's upset about. And I want to pray God's hand would be on this service today. Father, we come by the blood of Jesus. I thank you for people gathered in your house today. Lord, as your messengers reminded your people in times past, God, I pray that this message would be a reminder, a healthy reminder to have the fear of God, the fear of you, the fear of judgment, the fear of your wrath. I'm praying, God, that you would check our hearts. God, free us from presumptuous sins. And we pray, God, that you would Keep us, keep our hearts close to you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. God's people would say, amen. I want to begin by telling you the biblical reason why, why is hell necessary? Now that's, (laughs) again, not your typical Sunday morning message, but hell truly is necessary. And I want to show you why from the word of God. And because it is important for us to understand the glory of, the power, the sweetness of our salvation, we're truly not going to appreciate it unless we know about the alternative. What is hell? What does the Bible teach about hell? I'm not here to uh, aggrandize. I'm not here to, uh, to sensationalize. I just want to show you what the Bible says. Is that okay? Can the preacher preach from the Word of God? Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. What? 
Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel is looking forward to the time of resurrection. Well, we believe in a resurrection, don't we? We believe that Jesus, the Son of God, who was the prototype of the dead coming back to life, that just as he was resurrected, that those who follow him will also be resurrected one day that our dead cold bodies be reunited with our spirits and we will have physical resurrection in the same way that Jesus did. That's a powerful truth this morning. But that's not the only resurrection the Bible predicts. There is also a resurrection into judgment. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus is probably the most clear teaching on hell comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. Did you know that? Jesus, the one who brought us salvation, the one who taught us the the Sermon on the Mount, the one who taught us to be kind and generous and to forgive our enemies, and the same Jesus who, uh, who taught us about the Father, who taught us to pray, the same Jesus... His attention was often on the subject of hell. We don't hear a whole lot about that, do we? Why? Matthew 25, verse 46, he said, These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So hell is a place of everlasting punishment. That means it doesn't end. That's a long time. Matthew 25, verse 41, he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting punishment. Fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, in your Bible, how many got a, 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 a printed Bible here with you this morning? If I look it up, I will find that that scripture is printed in red ink. That means that it's the words of Jesus himself. We should pay special close attention to it because it's not just the narrator. It's not just someone who stands in the place and allows the Holy Spirit to to speak the the Bible. No, this is the words of our Lord. And he's the one who says that there will be some people to which he will say, depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So hell is a place of everlasting punishment and everlasting fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus says, He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Mark 9, verse 44, or 43, he says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire which shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is saying you, it would be far better for you to go to heaven with one hand than to go to hell with two. Luke 16, 23. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. He, he says that this rich man ends up in, in hell. And being in torment, he lifts up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may send, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Hell is a place of torment, judgment, everlasting punishment. This is not cold doctrine or theology. This is the words of Jesus. This is his warning, not mine. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, these these, uh, who the Bible identifies as wicked or disobedient to the Lord, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Revelation 14.10, he himself shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. They will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. They who worship the beast and his image And finally, Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Why would a loving God, a God who is love, the Bible says, 
a God who is merciful, patient, and kind. What place does God have for a place like that? And I want to make the case to you this morning that the reason that hell is necessary is because of sin. If you cannot understand why hell is necessary, then it tells me that you don't understand the nature of sin. Sin is an offense to God. It stinks in his nostrils. Have you ever come home to your house to discover something stinks in here? Something died. We got to find it. Or we left the trash in the trash bin for too long. You, you open the door to your house and you, what is that? And you know what? You're not going to rest until you find it. You're not going to go to bed. You're not going to sit down. You're going to open the windows. You're going to light a few candles, but you're going to find the source of that stench. Is that true? Maybe Doggy left a little pile for you. You're not just going to leave it there. You're going to find it. You're going to destroy it. You're going to get rid of it. The Bible says that sin is like a stench that rises into the nostrils of God. Your sins, my sins, the sin of all humanity is, a, is an overwhelming stench in the nostrils of God. And I want to tell you, God did not create us to sin. This is not part of his original design. The original design would be Adam and Eve in the garden in a state of innocence, having access to the tree of life, but not to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't touch that tree. As long as they were in that state, there was no sin, which means there was no death, which means there was no hell except for the devil and his angels. Hell was only created as a place to judge the devil when he rebelled against God. This was not for people. This was not, for, this was not for, uh, for those who bear his image. God created hell as a response to the rebellion which occurred in heaven. There had to be a place to punish sin, and hell was that place. Hell is the only hope to bring perfect justice. The reason that hell is necessary then is because there are some things that we cannot repay in this life. I want to tell you what I'm talking about. The reason to me why this is actually, before we get to the end, you're going to have some hope. I promise. The reason why this is a hopeful message, not a harmful message, is because only in the eternity of God's punishment and wrath can there finally be an answer for sin. Imagine with me. How many crimes go unpunished? How many rapes? How many murders? How many molestations that never get caught? How many times are people abused? How many times are people killed even? And the the perpetrator never even gets caught, never gets convicted, or gets off on on a loophole. And this world is not able to properly punish all of sin. Is that correct? What about those who commit extreme types of evil? those who commit genocide? What about those regimes, uh, the Nazis, for example, uh, the Adolf Hitler who led the, the Nazi regime to literally try to wipe out an entire race of people? My last trip to Washington, I went and visited the Holocaust Memorial for the first time, and it's horrific to see the piles of bodies that they produced in their effort to wipe out the Jews. They almost did it. Six and a half million Jewish people, in addition to the gypsies and the, uh, you know, the mentally unstable and, and, and those uh, political prisoners and Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, I didn't know they were included in all that. They say 12 million people they, they destroyed in, in a matter of only four or five years. And so, you know, we know that, that Hitler killed himself when he knew that he was going to get caught, but let's say that they caught him. What kind of punishment are you going to give to this guy? What are you going to do to him to make him pay for his crimes? What are you going to do to him to make him feel the pain for 12 million people killed under his authority? You can't. You can pull out his teeth and his toenails, and you can try to torture him, but listen, it's still not going to be enough. 
to make up for the pain, the loss, the tragedy, the lives that are destroyed, the family trees which have been wiped out for generations. What I'm saying to you today, only hell can the wrath of God be perfectly fulfilled. This is why hell is necessary. Because God is righteous. Because God is just. Because God is holy. Hell is the only hope to bring perfect justice. Colossians 3.25 says, If you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favorites. I want to tell you this morning that I cannot believe in a God that is unjust. I cannot believe in a God that is unfair. Because that's no God at all. That's a God that, uh, that is unworthy of any praise. Therefore, we have to embrace the reality that there is a hell and God does send people there. It's because of sin. So with that understanding and that foundation, now I want to talk about why then does the Bible bring up the reality of hell even for the believers? I think that we can, we can agree pretty easily that wickedness deserves punishment. And if that wickedness is not punished in this world, that there is a world to come in which God is able to execute his justice perfectly. But what we find in our scripture is something very interesting. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking to the church, speaking to the believer, speaking to the one. And he even says to them, he says, you were raised with Christ. Set your mind on things above. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. He is He is very obviously telling them, I believe you guys are on the right side. You're not going to hell, thank God. And yet in the very next sentence, he reminds them about the wrath of God. Verse 6 said, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So I ask you this morning, why is it necessary for us to consider hell as people who are saved? people who have had an experience with Christ at the cross. We know that for the sinner it's necessary because this is the path that the sinner is on. How many of you all have ever seen the Toy Story series? Uh, Just to inject a little bit of levity here, I want to show you, uh, maybe it's not levity, but uh, I want to show you a little clip from uh, the Toy Story 3 where they are being, uh, they're about to get betrayed by Lotso, the stuffed bear who smells of strawberry. Use control arrow, Jaylee. Control arrow. Right or left. There we go. You all remember this scene? Hit play. The reason that I remember this scene in the movie is because most people spend their life on that conveyor belt. They think everything's going to be okay. Oh, it's just daylight at the end. But that's not daylight. Because of sin... The Bible says it is appointed for men once to die, and after this, the judgment. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's important for the sinner to understand what the end of sin is. And this was your end, unless you got saved. Thank God that we can get saved this morning. I'm going to get there at the end. Don't worry. But there's an interesting reason why the Apostle Paul brings this up to remind the people of God. This text was written to saints, not sinners. Verse 5, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Why? Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sins of dis- sons of disobedience. This is not the only time the apostle does this. In Romans, he speaks to the church there, and he says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. He's reminding the church in Rome, you need to live right, because the alternative is the incinerator. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Speaking to the church. Ephesians 5, verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. And 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 6, The Lord is an avenger in all these things. 
as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Thank God for warnings this morning. How many of you have ever gotten a warning? A warning is an act of God's mercy. A warning, listen, when, when you're driving down the highway and you see the sign, dangerous turn ahead, slow down. That is a gift. What happens if you ignore the warning? Bad things only. The reason why Paul uses these warnings and reminds the church of impending judgment is because it is used as a warning. Even though at the same time, Paul affirms their faith. To the Romans, he said that they were full of goodness. To the Corinthians, he said that they were sanctified in Christ Jesus. To the Ephesians, he said, they were already seated with Christ in glory. To the Colossians, he said that they were rejoicing in the firmness of their faith. And to the Thessalonians, he said that he knew God had chosen them. So you have this balance where Paul on the one hand is saying, I believe that you are saved, that you're right with God, that you're going the right direction. And on the other hand, he's saying, be careful because God is judged. He is just. He is righteous. And he does not let sin slide. He saw this as a part of his ministry. In Colossians 3.16, Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know what the word admonishing means? It means rebuking, warning that this is part of the Christian life. is supposed to be us warning one another, brother, you should be careful. If you continue in this way, it can lead to hell. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly and comfort the faint-hearted. The job of the preacher and the job, indeed, of every believer this morning is often to comfort the afflicted. We understand people come into church hurt and broken and lost, and we need to comfort those who are broken. But also the other side of that coin is that we are supposed to afflict the comfortable. And that is who Paul is after in this scripture. He is afflicting those. He is warning those, be careful, my brother. To continue in this way means judgment. There are three reasons this morning why we must be warned of hell. Number one is to wake up the presumptuous. Don't get confused by the large word. It just means when you make an assumption. You know what happens when you make assumptions, right? When you assume things, I'm not going to repeat it because it's not a Christian phrase. But when you assume things, it makes something out of you and me. That's what it means to live presumptuously, to act as if everything's fine. Psalm 19, verse 13, this is the prayer of David. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Hell, the teaching of hell, the reminder of God's wrath is a siren. It is a clanging bell in the middle of the night to awaken those who are spiritually asleep. It's a danger sign for those who are drifting off the narrow road. It is a thorny path for those who are too comfortable near the dangerous cliff of sin. When Paul reminded the Corinthians about the coming judgment, the reason was because if you read the letter 1 Corinthians, that there were people that were doing things in the church in Corinth. They were not acting right. There were some who were arrogant when they should have been in fear and trembling. I'm sure you don't know anybody like that who are arrogant and proud when they should be fearful and trembling. There are also those in Corinth who treated sexual immorality with indifference. No big deal. Everybody's doing this. I'm sure that that doesn't apply to our world today, but let me just continue just in case. There were also people in Corinth who did not hesitate to bring their brothers into the court. And Paul said, this this shouldn't be like this, my brothers. That there are some things happening in the church there. And he's saying, don't you understand that there are people who are going to hell today because of these things? It was used as a warning. True love has to warn. 
when people are in danger. If your child begins running toward a, a, a busy road, what kind of parent are you if you don't warn them? What kind, of, what kind of parent would just allow their child to run into Lynn Haven Parkway? No, you warn them. You shout. You lift your voice. You get angry. The neck bulges. Get away from that road. There's danger. A reminder of the reality of hell can be a necessary affliction to those who have become comfortable in their casual sins. If you had a neighbor and in the middle of the night you looked out your window and noticed that their house was on fire, I hope that you would have enough common sense and decency to get out of bed and knock on their door. Hello? Is anyone in there? Please. You would not whisper, excuse me, is anyone at home? No, you wouldn't whisper. You would make a noise. If you care about your neighbor, you would shout, you would beat the door down, you would make sure nobody's in that house because it's about to be destroyed. And in the same way, in the church, sometimes, guess what? We need a little bit of knocking. In the church, we need a little bit of shouting because there are those of us who can be in danger. The second reason why the wrath of God is employed in Paul's letters is to protect the vulnerable. Usually there are stern words to beloved brothers and sisters. He does this because we are in the world. And as long as we're in the world, we are vulnerable. Say vulnerable. You know what that means? That means you are able to be attacked. You're in danger. Ephesians 5 verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. We live in a time of empty words where sin has become so normal, so normal as part of our everyday life. You know, one, one thing I remember when we moved to Bulgaria. Now, you might think that our culture is saturated in sexual sin, and it is. But as bad as it is, it is worse in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, they are, they are not shy about putting, like, straight-up pornography on billboards in public. And I learned very quickly that in different cultures, there are different levels of what is acceptable, where there is no shame about men hiring prostitutes. That's just part of the normal, everyday life over there. And so I had to readjust what, what the culture expected. But what I could not readjust was the expectations of God. Hello? Hello? In our culture, we have a certain level of what is considered acceptable. It's okay to just look. Look, uh, I don't know if anybody here goes to the gym. I've been trying to go to the gym, trying to lose a little bit of, late, of weight. <clears throat> I've been late doing that, but, you know. But one thing I've noticed more and more is women showing up to the gym dressed like strippers. And that is, that is just accepted. And I even heard that there are guys who go to the gym just for that reason. It's just viewed as acceptable. Am I being real this morning? And we just accept it like that's normal, like that's every day. Like, uh, okay, it's, it's not okay to dress like a stripper anywhere else, but you go to the gym and you can, why? And what I'm saying this morning is that there are those who are vulnerable. If we are not reminded that adultery deserves the judgment of God, pornography deserves the judgment of God, Financial sins, stealing, deserves the judgment of God. We have to keep and maintain the standards that God has for us. The love of money, luxury, bullying, online. It's not okay just because you can't see someone's face, but that is every day in our culture. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's why we need the reminder that God is the judge. I can't follow you around and approve or disapprove of everything that you do, I wouldn't want to do that. I can barely do that for myself. But listen, God. 1 John 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world is passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Do you see the balance that the Scripture brings? The reminder of God's wrath also finally brings humility to those who are mature. 
I want you to hear me. This is for us. This is for those who would view themselves as mature in the faith. Now listen, it is good to have confidence in the salvation of Jesus. I don't want people walking around wondering if they're saved or not. I I want you to know that if you are saved, if you are right with God, if you have repented, God wants to give us a confidence in him, but not overconfidence. There's a difference. And to those who are mature in our faith, Paul did not think that they were too strong for danger or too firm to fall. Romans 11, verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. This is coming from the argument that he anticipates. Well, I can be I can be confident in my salvation because the Lord grafted me as a branch into the tree of God's family. Thank God. Yes. But don't forget, there were some branches that he cut off. Have we become overconfident? I'm so mature. I'm so strong in my faith. I can take on a grizzly bear. Can you? Even Paul did not exempt himself from the warnings of judgment. Listen to what he said. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26. Therefore, I run this way, not with uncertainty. I fight as one who beats the air. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. He's saying, I'm not exempt either. I have to be careful. I don't want to lose track. I don't want to become so overconfident. Can I tell you, we are all one or two decisions away from disaster, from turning away from the master who saved us. You are one or two decisions away from blowing up your family, from messing up your destiny. Thank God, God has brought us to where we are. But I want to tell you, it takes a whole lot more to build something up than it does to destroy it. There's a pastor. His name was Robert Murray Machine. He was a theologian in the 1800s, and there was Uh, an instance of him writing to another minister of the gospel, and they were having a conversation back and forth through writing letters. And this is one of the letters he wrote to his friend, to his brother in Christ, and to another minister of the gospel. This is what he wrote. He said, I charge you, be clothed with humility, or you will yet be a wandering star for which is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. If you lead sinners to yourself and not to Christ, Emmanuel will cast the star out of his right hand into utter darkness. It is important for us to be reminded sometimes, God is just, God is righteous, God is holy. Before we close, once you consider that, consider that sin is deserving of God's wrath, then it becomes so much sweeter to know that God saves sinners. This is where it gets real good. With these things in mind, I want you to listen again to the life-changing message of the gospel from John chapter 3. Jesus answered, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means in our natural state, our default, our default position of life is that we can't see the kingdom of God and we will never see the kingdom of God. But verse 15, whoever believes in him, in Jesus should not perish, but have an eternal life. God so loved the world. Wait a second. Are you telling me that God loves sinners? God loves people who deserve his wrath? That's true. God loved the world. How much did he love the world? That he gave his only begotten son. Who's that? Jesus. What other gift did God have to give? It's the greatest gift that has ever been given. God gave his only son so that whoever believe in him would not perish, would not die, would not receive their just reward, but have everlasting life. Can I ask you, do you deserve everlasting life? Anybody here? You deserve that? But he gives it willingly to those who will turn from their sins. Verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. This is not a bummer message. This is a glory to God message. 
that we can be saved, we can be delivered from sin. I mentioned before that the only answer to sin is in hell. And I was only half right. There's another answer for sin. Sins that are not punished in hell, there's only one other option. What Christ did on the cross is the punishment that I deserve. What the Bible says is that to anyone who would trust in the Lord Jesus, who would receive and believe this gospel message, what happens is a miracle. I deserve to pay the price for my own sins in hell for all eternity, and so do you. But when you cry out to God, Lord, save me, I'm lost, I'm broken, then what happens is that God takes all of your sins. That's a lot of sins, by the way. Think about how many sins that is. Is it a dozen? How many lies? Is it a hundred? How many, how many acts of fornication? How many acts of deceitfulness? How many acts of theft? Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? For each and every one of us. What I'm saying is that God takes all your sins, the past, the present, and the future. And the Bible says that Jesus pays the price for them on the cross. Jesus did not deserve the cross. He's the only one who lived a whole life without sin. And yet he was rejected by the world. This is why he became the candidate to receive upon himself in his own body the payment, the penalty of God on Christ for your sins. That's the gospel. I don't deserve it. Neither do you. But it's available to all who will receive it by faith. My brothers, my sisters, it is necessary for our lives to be changed. It is necessary for us to not remain in our sin. Why? Because those who remain in their sin will be destroyed. But the good news of the gospel, it it doesn't have to be that way. He loves you. He wants to save you. And he will receive you when you trust in him this morning. It doesn't sound a lot sweeter once you know the alternative. Let's bow our heads. We're going to close our eyes. For just a few moments, maybe you've come into this place today, and maybe this was kind of a, an abstract idea in your head the, the, of heaven and hell. Yes, maybe there, there is such a thing. I'm not sure who's going to go there. Certainly not me. I, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. The Bible makes a statement that just as real as heaven is, so also is hell. You can't have one without the other. And if you've come here today and maybe you've put two and two together, can I just share with you very quickly? The reason that I got saved is because I never made this connection before that moment when I was 16 years old. I had never put the two and two together. That I was a sinner. I knew that there were sinners in the world. I just didn't think I was one of them. And I realized for the first time as a 16-year-old kid, I realized that it was my sin that was leading me to eternal destruction. When I understood that, I said, God, is there any hope for somebody like me? And in that moment, I cried out to the Lord, and he heard my prayer, and I'm so grateful that all these years later, that I've been on my way to to, to heaven, that he saved me and set me free. But I wonder, have have you made that connection this morning? So many people assume that just going to church or just doing good deeds or just being a little bit religious or reading a few scriptures or saying a few prayers, and they think that's enough. That's enough to get me to, I'm a good person. But I want to share with you this morning, there's only one thing that gets you to heaven, and that is what Christ did for you on the cross, receiving that. Jesus died for all, but not all are saved because not all put their complete trust and faith in Jesus, asking him for forgiveness. And I want to ask you this morning, have you done that? Have you trusted in Christ for your salvation? Have you turned from the wickedness that leads to destruction? I said, Lord, I need you to save me. I'm lost. I'm broken. If that's you this morning, I want to pray with you. There is mercy of God. There is the grace of God waiting upon those who deserve his destruction. But you've got to, you've got to turn to him in faith. And I want to ask if there's anyone here today, you're not saved, but you need to be. You realize that today. I don't want to go to hell. I want to know that there's a God in heaven who cares about me. 
If that's you, I want to pray with you today. Would you do one thing for me quickly with some courage? You would just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need salvation. I need God's healing. I need his mercy. I need his grace. I want to be free from my sin. Is that you? Quickly, just slip up your hand so I can see it. I want to believe God with you. Is there someone here unsaved? Maybe backslidden in your heart. There was a time that you lived for God fully. But you're here today. You've fallen into some sins, into some life decisions that have pulled you away from the will of God. It's time to come home. Are there any prodigal sons and daughters? Time to come home this morning. Would you lift up your hand? I want to pray with you. There is a God who cares. He has not turned his back on you. He has not forgotten. He is here this morning to set the captive free, to open prison doors. He's waiting for an open and an honest heart. Would you lift up your hand so I can see it? Is there someone here? Quickly, quickly, as God deals with your heart. It doesn't happen every day. Maybe now's the time. Would you lift up your hand, unsaved or backslidden in your heart? There's hope for you, for anyone who turns to Jesus. Is that you? Quickly, let me see your hand. Is there anyone at all? Quickly. Thank God. Then let me turn to the congregation this morning. There's a reason why. In many times and in many ways, the Apostle Paul and even the Lord Jesus Christ brought up the topic of judgment and hellfire. Because it, it, it demands a response. And maybe there's people here who have become presumptuous in our sins. We've become comfortable in the atmosphere of the world. We just assume that everything's okay in the sinful world that we live in. And, and let's not forget in this life that we are living, there are certain behaviors, attitudes, thoughts that we allow in our mind that if not dealt with leads to destruction let this be a warning and a reminder to all of us this morning god is holy yes god is loving god is merciful god is but god is also righteous and he is also holy and he is also a good judge who leaves no sin unpunished And this ought to humble us this morning and lead us back to him. Lord, I need your spirit today to lead me into a life of righteousness. Amen. I want to open up this altar for prayer. If God has brought a warning into your heart today, I want to ask you to come and pray. Would you lift up? Would you stand up to your feet? We're going to open up this altar for prayer. Lord, I want to please you with my life. Lord, I don't I don't want to become comfortable in the little sins, in the things that I excuse, I compromise. Lord, I want to fall in love with you. I want to know your will for my life. And I want to do it with all of my heart. Would you come? We're going to pray together here at this altar. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. We have all fallen short of God's glory. But there is hope for us when we turn to him in faith. Lord, set me free. I need you to change my heart. Amen. We're going to pray for a few moments here at this altar. Would you bow your heart? And bow your knee before the Lord as we pray. Can I ask you this morning, what is the thing that keeps you doing right when nobody else sees, when nobody else knows? What is the thing that keeps you from taking something that doesn't belong to you when nobody's ever going to find out? You know what it should be? The fear of God. What is the thing that keeps you, men, from lusting after women? What's the thing? When nobody else will ever know. Where are you going to put your eyes? What's the thing that keeps you from doing that? I'll tell you what it is. The fear of God. What is the thing that keeps you from visiting that website in the middle of the night when no one will see, when no one will know what it should be? There is a God in heaven who is watching. Now, that, that is true to keep us from doing evil, but it's even more true that God is a rewarder of those who trust in him, those who will do right even when there's no reward for it, that God sees he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I want to challenge you. I want to pray with you this morning. I appreciate everyone taking the time this morning. Would you lift up your hand? I want to pray with you. I want to believe God with you today. Let's say this prayer together. Say, God in heaven, I thank you. You are merciful. God, you are patient. You are kind. Because of the blood of Jesus, 
I can be washed clean. And I'm asking you today to restore in my heart a healthy fear of God. I acknowledge your holiness, your justice, your retribution against wickedness. And I'm believing you now to set me free, fill me with your spirit, so I can live a different kind of life, different from the world, different than the lust of my flesh. Lead me, empower me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him praise right now. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. Parents, I want to just, uh, last word, parents, if you have children, you should teach your children the fear of God. When, you, uh, when your kids ask you, why do I need to do that? Don't just say, because I said so. You know why you don't say that? Because the, the moment that they're out of your house and there's some other authority that says, because I said so, they're just going to follow that authority instead of you. When, you. when your children ask you, why should I obey you? You should tell them, because the Lord says to honor your mother and your father. And that there is a judgment for children that don't do that. Teach your children the fear of God. Because if all they do is obey you when your watchful eyes are on them, guess what happens when your watchful eyes are not on them? But guess whose watchful eyes are always on them? Teach your children the fear of the Lord. I'm trying to train my kids because I want them to live forever in heaven. Amen? Oh, so grateful. I appreciate your patience this morning as we go through some difficult scriptures, but I believe it's worthy for us to consider. Thank you for listening to this message from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. If you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you out of your sins and into a new life with Him, pray this prayer from your heart today. God in heaven, I know I've sinned against you. I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, and I've broken your laws. Today, I turn from my sins as I surrender to your perfect will. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son and that He died and rose again for me. I receive Him today as my Lord and Savior. May the old things of my past pass away as you make me a new creation. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me strength to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We want to help you live for God. Please join us in person for one of our upcoming church services. We are located in the heart of Virginia Beach at 1045 Lynn Haven Parkway, about one mile from the Lynn Haven Mall. Please check the show notes for links to our website and social media. You can also find a link to support this ministry with a generous donation. We would be so grateful. We look forward to sharing future messages here on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. In the meantime, we pray that God would strengthen you to serve Him with all your heart.